Many of you might find it surprising, but I've got something in common with Clint Eastwood. And that's that we both get completely overexcited about things that are invisible. <laughs> um, and, and, <laughs> and while I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to overexcite anyone here tonight, I would like to think that I could make you see something that you might not necessarily look at every day uh, and see beyond the invisible. For him, it was the invisible Barack Obama in a chair, and for me, it's the lowly radio wave, something that you use every single time you make a mobile call or you use your sat-nav. This is a bunch of our students from our lab um, engaged in cutting-edge telecommunications research, as you can see. Um, but what they're actually doing, and, they, and they've done this especially for this TED event, um, they're actually reenacting something I saw a group of kids do. And what those kids were doing, they were in an area that had a really poor uh, signal. They'd somehow figured out that higher up the signal was good, so that if they carefully coordinated jumping and pressing send on their text message, the text messages got through. And I was completely intrigued by this, because they clearly knew nothing about radio waves, they clearly knew nothing about electromagnetic spectrum, and yet they had a really tangible interaction with that very intangible medium. And I just think that's very, very fascinating. I'm afraid to say that us engineers have a far more boring way of making radio waves tangible. We speak in terms of frequencies, and in fact, the whole radio wave world is organized from a frequency perspective. So there's a finite range, and within that range, we put frequencies aside for TV, for radio, um, for public safety, for mobile phones, for military uses, etc. And the really, really good thing for me is that very many of you want to do more and more things that need radio waves to function. There are six billion mobile users in the world, all wanting more data, wanting richer data, wanting it faster. And we're not now just interested in communicating with other humans. As the world becomes increasingly instrumented with sensors, we want to actually also talk to the objects in our lives. So that's hundreds of billions of more wireless um, connections. So a very obvious question, and a question that many people are asking today, is are there enough radio waves to go, to go around? And the answer, if you look at the situation currently, is that there aren't. If you actually take a formal frequency allocation chart, it actually looks very much like what I've drawn here. It's crowded, there's very, very little space. Um, it's really, really hard to get access to the empty frequencies, and it's absolutely impossible to move anyone out of the frequencies that they have already. Hey, why should this matter to anybody here? Um, what's the tangible um, effect of that on your lives? And I think the simplest way that I can say that, and sometimes it, uh, it can be hard to find the exact right way to say that for people, but the simplest way I can say that is think how frustrating it is to send a text message on New Year's Eve, and it'll just be like that every day of your lives if we don't do something about it. So engineers have been kind of looking at this uh, situation for the past number of years, and one thing that people began to do is they began to kind of look behind the scenes and say, what's really happening in those frequencies? How are they being used? So it's actually possible to go out there with a measuring device and figure out what's happening and look at how occupied or how busy those frequencies are. And this uh, very precisely drawn diagram actually looks like something that we would get from a spectrum analyzer when we measured how busy frequencies were. And suppose, for example, that this was a bunch of frequencies that's owned by a specific service. What you actually begin to see is that some of those frequencies are really, really heavily used. Some of those frequencies are completely lightly used, and some of those not at all. And despite them being empty, or despite them being lightly used, no one else except the owner of those frequencies and their customers can use that. The idle capacity just lies there wasted. So essentially what we're doing to this resource is we're taking a resource that is by nature plentiful, and we're actually managing it into scarcity. Uh, some resources are naturally scarce, like oil, but what we're doing, it's the rules that we're choosing that's making this scarce and making it a resource that we cannot get plentiful access to. And I think it's really, really interesting to think of the resource like that because that's actually what we do to a lot of resources in the world today. So for us, what we want to do is we want to manage it out of scarcity. We want to manage it back into abundance. And that has been a challenge for Radio Wave or radio engineers over the past number of years. So the really, really difficult thing, it turns out, is that radio waves are very, very hard to share. It's hard to allow other systems and other devices into your space. So the best way for me to explain this at the moment is to think about this venue. 
Um, if, for example, somebody decided to grab another microphone and stand up there and talk at the same time as me, we couldn't share the space with both of us speaking as loudly as I'm speaking now. Uh, we'd interfere with each other, we'd cause interference. Um, I've been sitting in the audience for the afternoon listening to fantastic talks, and this is the most attentive audience that I've ever, ever seen in my life. But think for a minute, supposing you were a bunch of engineers that I was teaching, and you were slightly less attentive. It would be possible for some people to whisper and not interfere with me. But if everyone was to start whispering, you would interfere with me eventually. Alternatively, and I'm, I'd hate to stop anyone, if anyone would like to shout adoring comments at me from the audience, um, I personally wouldn't cons consider that interference, even if other people might. But my main point here is that interference is contextual. It completely depends on the circumstances. And the more open and indiscriminating you are in allowing everyone and anyone into the situation, the more unforeseen the circumstances, the more uncertain, the more unexpected things that can arise. And the key message is that traditionally, we have always designed technology for certainty and for expected circumstances. So what we need to do now, what we need to do for the modern era, is we need to rethink how we design, and we need to design for the uncertain, and we need to expect the unexpected. So how do we do that? And the answer actually is, is we make radios like people. So people are agile, they can look at circumstances around them, they can understand that they have to behave in a particular way, they can learn and they can change their behaviours. And this is actually what we do when we design the radios of tomorrow. So we take a mobile phone, which is already a fairly fantastic and amazing device with huge amount of capabilities, and we add much more to that device. We give it eyes and ears by adding sophisticated sensors that allow it to observe the world around it. We give it a brain through drawing and techniques from artificial intelligence and machine learning. We give it guile and we give it the ability to strategize by using things called game theory, mechanisms from game theory. We make it sociable by designing protocols that would allow the radios to actually communicate with each other, negotiate with each other, bargain with each other. And we make those radios highly flexible so they don't need to behave in the way that they were always designed to at the beginning. They can change their behavior. So ladies and gentlemen, this kind of radio can share. It can look out there, it can spot what spectrum is free. It can understand whether the, that's the, those radio waves, those frequencies are completely free, whether it needs to share it with other people. It can ask its pal radios if it's annoying them. Uh, it can temper its behavior to do that. And it can strategize how to get the most out of that. It's a sociable radio, it's a society of radios, a social network of radios is the way I see it. So where are we today? So where we are at the moment is that this kind of technology is emerging. But unfortunately, the rules that, if you want to put it like this, that would breed life into this kind of technology are really slow to follow. And if you have to stand back and ask why that, it really is because of fear. And there are many, many reasons that people tend to fear new and changes. So I think the first one, and it's a really, really important one, this technology signals an erosion of authority. It actually moves the power away from the central authority, from the regulator, from the particular uh, political entity, out into the distributed machines themselves. They figure things out. They decide what interference is. Somebody doesn't tell them what it is. The second way I think it challenges people and brings fear into them uh, relates to the fact it challenges how we can own and control networks of the future. Now, to explain that, I need to just step back for a minute and explain a related point. There are probably many people in this audience, especially a TEDx audience, who are probably very interested in internet freedoms, you know, net neutrality, or have opinions about ACTA and PIPA and SOPA. And the rea reality is, is that the vast majority of people who think about these things or engage in debate about them do so and think about all of the things that sit on top of the physical network. It's about the content and the copyright issues. It's about the applications and access to data. It's about the protocols and whether those protocols are snooping or are, are providing privacy. It's never about the physical entity of the network itself. And in my opinion, we ignore the physicality of the network, the network infrastructure at our pearl. Because whatever we do to free up the situation higher up the layers, we undo that if we don't think who owns that network, who controls that network, and where can I play a part. And when I stand back and say the kinds of technologies that I'm talking about here can actually bring uh, new freedoms, uh, I want you to think a little bit about Wi-Fi. So what Wi-Fi is, is another term for this, is a user-deployed infrastructure. And what I mean by that is that everybody here can deploy Wi-Fi. We don't need to be an expert. Um, we can just go out and put it out there. But the term hotspot is a particularly apt 
term for Wi-Fi because that's what it is. It's spots of connectivity. The rules only allow Wi-Fi to work at certain frequencies and certain powers, and it limits the range. So you never have a large-scale network competing with other large-scale networks that are owned and controlled by other entities. So supposing now we change the rules and we allow the kinds of radios that I'm advocating to operate. So what we will see is that these radios could easily be redeployed by any of us. We don't need to be an expert because the expertise will re reside in these radios. They can seek out new frequencies, they can seek out frequencies that are better for longer range, they can alter the power, they can change their behavior, and they can knit together into a blanket network, into a large-scale network, a network that would strike fear into the incumbent. The final thing I'd like to say in terms of fear, and I think this is another important point, these radios are completely hard to define. They're hard to police, they're hard to certify, they're unbounded. And I think putting this into context, I think you can think of it this way, and this is my equation for the, for the evening. If the Apollo 11, with the electronics of a toaster, got somebody to the moon, I think we have to say, what can a very, very sophisticated machine, like we have, I've described here, and like, our, like, like is evolving all the time, what kind of things they can do? What kind of ne networks of these things, the emergent properties they have, you know, it, it just, there's huge uh, advances that can be made. And for me, that's a fantastic opportunity. And for many people, that unboundedness is something that's fearful. So, what I want to say to people here tonight is forget the fear, think about new, and think about new world order. And these radios, I think, can offer us many new opportunities. And in a way, they really reflect what's happening in our lives already. So I spoke about them challenging authority. And we see that happening all around us through citizen journalism, through e-citizenship, um, through crowdsource science, where we come from the bottom up and challenge the powers that be. They also challenge how we consume. So we're moving away from ownership to access, we're moving away from hyper-consumption to collaborative, um, collaborative consumption. And whether I'm talking about couch surfing, whether I'm talking about Dublin bikes, or whether I'm talking about sharing radio waves, that is all the same thing. They also reflect the changing economic status that we see in the world. Um, that bottom-up notion coming in again, the Kickstarter approach, the funded approach, and I think that's really, really interesting. And finally, I think they hugely reflect the trajectory that the mobile phone is taking. So, once upon a time, it was completely unimaginable that anyone would create content other than experts who'd been trained in it, and now everybody does. And once upon a time, it was completely unimaginable that anyone would de design applications, expect software experts who worked with specific hardware, and now hundreds and thousands of apps are uploaded every day. And while currently it's inconceivable that a large-scale blanket network would be built by anyone except a central authority and an expert network planner, I think we can be the network builders of the future. So I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, occupy spectrum and embrace the new. Thank you.